From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives. She's a chartered financial analyst. On Money Talks, we're always ready to answer your personal finance questions. While we wait for your phone calls this morning, though, we have some hacks that can save you money. So good morning, Nancy. Hope you're doing well this morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Uh, getting ready to go out of town next week to visit some friends in California. So looking forward to that, trying to get everything ah. buttoned up here at work to cover me uh, being off next week. But uh, that's my, my annual summer vacation. So that's quite a trek. What part of California? Uh, Palm Springs. Oh, my goodness, where the beautiful people go, right? <laughs> yes, it's nice to have friends in, in nice yes. places like that. Yeah. <laughs> I have a brother who lives on the beach and friends in Palm Springs, so I, sh- I can't ask for any more. You've got it covered. The problem with going to California from Mississippi is it's quite a trek uh, going through those airports. And actually, uh, mine was changed. It was uh, added a stop. So I'm going uh, Jackson to Houston, uh, Houston to San Francisco, and then San Francisco to Palm Springs with a lengthy layover in San Francisco. But I've learned from previous uh, flights that uh, I don't really mind having a long layover because it gives you a lot of leeway in case some of your earlier legs of the flight are delayed or whatever. Because that's my one worry about flying is, you know, getting stuck somewhere in the middle, where you're not intended to go and, you know, and with kind of nothing to do. So hopefully all will go well for me next week. Well, but it just makes for a long day. It does. It does. I'll uh, think uh, get up at uh, maybe 4.30 and arrive uh, California uh, our time at about 10 o'clock. So should be should be an, an interesting day. Well, have fun. And people watching. I mean, if you're a people watcher, what better place than an airport? Because there's all oh, kind of different people best. there. <laughs> Especially since we no longer dress up to fly. You know, we just wear our jammies. <laughs> That's true. I've seen that just several times. So uh, we always start out the show with financial news and the news. And I've got a question for you, but I'd like to see your take on the news first. Well, um, what's on my mind right now uh, has to do with all the storms that swept across the South and the Midwest over the weekend. And certainly in Mississippi, we are familiar with tornadoes, and now we are on the cusp of another hurricane season. This is a good time to pull out your homeowner's insurance policy and really look at what it covers. We're starting to see a lot of companies back up on coverage. They're dropping people. They're raising their prices. Remember, insurance is governed by each state. So in states like California or in Florida, they are really struggling with um, really high premiums and companies leaving those states. They don't want to do business there because of these natural disasters. So pull out that policy. Make sure you still have good coverage. Understand what it covers if you live on the coast. You know, make sure that there is some coverage for flood um, insurance if you need that in your area. And heaven knows with a big storm, sometimes you don't think you need it. But a lot of people got hit during Katrina that were never flooded before. So this is a good time just to pull it out, take a look at it, maybe talk to your agent to see what the coverage provides, what it doesn't provide, and uh, make sure you can handle that risk. And so when you're adjusting your insurance, I would assume that as as soon as you make the adjustment on the coverage, I mean, does it come into effect immediately? It should, as long as you are following up with the premium, if there is a premium increase involved in that. All right. Uh, So the thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, in the news right before we came on, I heard that uh, T-Mobile is buying U.S. Cellular um, and that uh, the stock of U.S. Cellular went up, which I wasn't quite sure about. But my question is, uh, when there is a merger, say I own U.S. Cellular stock and it's bought out by T-Mobile, do I now own T-Mobile stock? It depends. It depends on what the merger agreement is. Now, sometimes you have what's called a non excuse me, an all cash uh, buyout, which means if that happens, T-Mobile would be giving cash to every shareholder of U.S. Cellular. And the reason that U.S. Cellular usually goes up, the one being bought usually goes up because it's like, wow, you know, I have to pay extra for this to get the stock. Um, but in other cases, and many times this happens, where you were a shareholder in U.S. Cellular and then that gets converted to T-Mobile in some kind of ratio, and they will publish what that ratio is. They will let you know. 
would we expect T-Mobile stock to go up? Um, oftentimes, and it, of course it depends on what the merger is and how they're putting it together, but oftentimes the buyer is going to see the price go down. But then again, what you hope as the buyer, if you're merging, is that you're going to be able to wring some extra expenses out of the combined company. Um, and you know, I've heard it so many times before, Kevin, where people who work for a company like U.S. Cellular and they're being bought out, oh, they've told me I'm going to keep my jobs. That's not how it works. Um, they're going to streamline. Um, they're going to combine things. They're going to rid uh, duplication out of their company. And that usually ends up being um, a situation where they have an increase in their profit. And then one final thing is <clears throat> when something like this happens to where it becoming, you know, uh, one company sort of grabbing a larger stake of the pie, uh, are there usually any effects on other parts of the economy, stocks other in other areas? Well, when there are mergers like this, you often will see them come in groups, and that's often a sign that companies are feeling pretty good about the economy overall, and they're feeling good about their industry, and they're looking to buy up some smaller companies and consolidate. We're also going to be talking about some uh, hacks that might save you some money on your budget. And so, you know, Nancy, I see these lists a lot of times online, and I think they make for good discussion. And I think, though, when we ever go into something like this, obviously not everyone is going to benefit from every hack. But, I mean, sometimes it might even just give you a general idea of, hey, I never thought about that. Maybe I can do something to save money when it comes to, say, meal prep or something like that. Well, and our listeners have always had great ideas and tips that they use. I've learned from them through the years. And so it just depends on how you live, what your lifestyle is, and you can grab which of these that you need that you think you might be of help to you. So the first one on the list, I think, is probably more appropriate for people that have uh, larger families. Uh, for a single person like myself, maybe not such a good idea, but who knows. But it says to cook favorite meals in larger quantities and store extra portions in the freezer. Any thoughts? Well, yeah. I mean, I have a small household at this point. It's just my husband and myself. But I still will do some larger quantities and uh, split them up and freeze them. For me, it's more about having that convenience because if I'm going to go through all of that effort to um, make something that requires, you know, the chopping, the preparation, all of those things, the cooking, then if I make it in a larger amount and split it, then, you know, a couple of weeks down the road, when I don't feel like doing all of that, it's already made. And I would say, too, uh, when you're storing in the freezer, make sure, you know, you do it right, probably in maybe like a Ziploc bag, that sort of thing. And uh, some of them I like have the area where you can, with a Sharpie, write down, you know, well, I hope you don't have to write down what it is. I hope you can still see what I it do. is. I <laughs> well, do. It, it, I have to write down what it is. And I usually put a date on there right. so I know how long it's been in the freezer. And I'm not a health expert, but I would say that if it's in the freezer, I would think maybe – I don't know, several weeks and would be safe, I would guess. Well, at my house, we might go years. <laughs> that is a good idea then to write down what's on there. Yes. And also you could, you know, look and see if, if you, if it looks bad, I would say, you know, don't risk it. But, uh, you know, if you have a good freezer, it should, it should actually stay there uh, for a while. And that way you're not eating. Cause that's my problem as a single person too, is you cook something and then it's like, okay, well, I've got to eat blank for the next week or so. So maybe, oh, but you don't. Well, you that's don't. true. That's yeah. So yeah, we're saying store it in the freezer and and uh, maybe save it for a week or two down the road. And, you know, soup is a great one for that because if I'm going to make a, a pot of soup, I'm going to make a big pot of soup. I'm going to dump all this stuff in there. Um, but again, do I really want to eat that every day for a week? Maybe not. But I can put it in containers and have it for later. And also, I would say soup is an easy one to reheat. You know, some of these other things, if it's like a meal, you got to worry about vegetables and meat and reheating them and all. But uh, something like soup, that seems like that would be pretty easy to dethaw or I always say that wrong, to thaw it uh, and then pop it in the microwave or whatever to heat it up and, and you're good to go. Absolutely. You're listening to Money Talks. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone. Then you get to listen to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson. 
Nancy is ready to take your personal finance question, though while we wait for the phone lines to fill up today, we're talking about some money-saving hacks. So the first several money-saving hacks on our list uh, have to do with food. We talked before the break about uh, kind of cooking up uh, your favorite meal in larger quantities and using your freezer to store that and to um, share those extra portions at a later date. The next one is an interesting one. I don't think I've ever done this, but I think I might start trying to do that, and that is to align your meal planning with sales at the local grocery store. Sure. Um, that was a famous one my mother always did, pull out those circulars, and uh, now we can see that they're online, and you can see what is uh, on sale. Um, I always look uh, in the meat counter for those items that might be marked down. They're still quite good, and especially if it's something I'm going to cook pretty quickly then uh, and not stay in my freezer for a year, Kevin, um, then I can buy some of those and save a lot. Yeah, I, I, for whatever reason, I've never, I don't know why, but I've never looked at the sales circular, although you, as you mentioned, a lot of that uh, sale-related stuff is starting to show up online as well. Uh, but it's a good idea that if something's on sale and it's something that you're going to use anyway, that would be the time to go ahead and uh, and try to snag it and put it in the grocery cart there. Um, well, the only problem that you run into, I know my mother used to go to several grocery stores. And uh, she would make the rounds and pick up the sale items at each one. That might be a little harder for folks to do these days because of the price of gas, because of the time that it takes to be able to do that. Um, so you're going to have to concentrate on the one where you're going to get the most benefit. We've got a caller on the line, so let's go to Gloucester. Lewis has called in today. Good morning, Lewis. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Good morning. How are you today? Good. What do you have for us? Um, I, my, my wife passed away a week ago. It, she had a twenty thousand dollar life insurance policy. I don't know how they if they said that you could check on the bottom in your account. Lewis, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Anything to do with the money from the life insurance? Is that what you're asking about? Yes. Okay. Oh gosh, this is really hard because I don't know um, Lewis's family situation. So um, this sounds like maybe it's something you didn't quite expect. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's enough to really change some things for you. So the first thing to look at is do you have some debt? In particular, if there's some credit card debt, maybe use part of that to clear that out. If you don't already have a good savings account, I would say this is a good way to kickstart one and take part of that money and do that. You might even consider using this to fund some IRA accounts. So there's a combination of things you can do, even with $20,000. Um, but you really need to look at what your situation is. Certainly, this is not the time just to go out and blow everything. But at the same time, um, maybe you know you take part of that and do something fun with it, like take a trip or um, do something that helps the uh, improves your home in some way. But don't suck it all up. So think about coming up with a plan, how to slice and dice that to make the most of it. Look at all of your consumer debt. Look at something fun. Look at um, what, what needs you have at home. And then look at saving a portion of it. All right, Lewis, thanks for calling in this morning. And <clears throat> Nancy, we've mentioned this on the air before, and it's kind of what you've alluded to. If you get a windfall of some a money of some sort, uh, go ahead and maybe try to prioritize what you think maybe uh, your debt, paying down debt is. But uh, it's okay, too, uh, to to spend some of the money on yourself, as it yeah, were. Yeah, sure, um, to, to really enjoy life and do something with that. Um, but the problem is a lot of people don't plan for it. They don't really sit down and think about it. And before you know it, that 20000 gets frittered away and you have nothing to show for it. So be careful about that. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. We're looking for your personal finance questions this morning uh, as we talk about some money-saving hacks to fill time between your calls. We've got another food-related uh, money-saving hack, and this is a good one uh, that says choose seasonal produce, which tends to be less expensive. And also, Nancy, I know you like to uh, mention that if you support your local farmer's markets, you're helping out yeah. someone in your area and getting some good produce to boot. And my 
goodness, Mississippi has some of the best farmers markets. Uh, we have a long growing season. We have a history of support of our agriculture. And so this is a good time to go to the farmer's market, and you're going to get the best, the freshest. Um, and you can choose those things that are in season and build your meals around that. And I'm also dipping into growing some of my own things. Um, even if you don't have a plot of land where you can do that, you can grow some things in pots, which is what I'm trying to do, and um, and uh, have some of the, something that is fresh that you can just pick right off the vine. It's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, to me, the the difference between fresh and 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 not fresh produce, fruits and vegetables is really uh, stark. And so, if you're able to get those fresh ones, uh, that certainly would add a little zing to your uh, to your meals. I would think. Well, and I always uh, get to that farmers market and get some of those uh, fresh vegetables that I then put in my freezer or can, and so then you can have them all winter long. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. We've got some callers to get to on the phone line, so let's start again uh, with Jeremy, who's called in with a question for us. Go ahead, Jeremy. You're on the air. I've recently come into possession of a diamond ring, and I don't know where I would be able to sell it. I've come into it completely legitimately. A friend gave it to me. It said that it was from their aunt. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, you, you first need to find someone who can appraise that ring for you. So you should be able to take it to a local reputable jeweler who can then give you an idea of what the price range you can get on that ring. Um, you know, a lot of jewelry like that, you don't have some definite receipt that says, I'm the owner of this. Often it's passed down through families, and that's what this sounds like. Um then you can check with the jeweler to see, you know, will that jeweler purchase that ring from you? Does it have some special value? Does it have historical value? Or is it just the diamond and the gold or the silver that will be used for something else? Um, but expect with any kind of object like that, you know, even if they say, hey, it's worth $3,000, nobody's going to pay you 3000 for that. Um, they're going to pay you considerably less than that as they look at how they use it or how they can resell it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Good luck. You know, I'd also say maybe get a couple of uh, estimates. Um, but, Nancy, as you said, you might not get what what someone would say is the full value. But then if you have an idea from two or three estimates about how much it's worth, then if someone offers something, you can judge whether that's a decent offer or not. Well, and the same thing is true for gold coins. We've had a lot of clients show up at our door with gold coins. Um you know, it sounds great. You can look at the price per gold, uh, per ounce for gold and think, gosh, this is how much this is worth. You're not going to get that. You're going to have to find a gold dealer. It's often difficult to find those around the Jackson area. Usually you're going to have to look around New Orleans and uh, to be able to unload a lot of that, and you're going to take a big discount on it. So um, when it comes to passing down wealth, those things are usually not the best way to do it. We've got another call around the line. This time we're off to Gaucher. Alicia has called in today. You're on the air with us, so go ahead with your question, please. Hi. I have um, accumulated some credit card debt from opening a business, and I'm wondering, the credit card debt, because they're high, um, high, there's a high credit usage on the credit cards, has made my personal credit score go way down. And so I'm wondering if it's a good financial decision to try to get a home equity line of credit to pay off oh. the credit card. Go ahead and um, possibly. Now, Alicia, this is very common when someone is opening up a new business. They will fall back on credit cards if they can't use bank financing or some other financing. Um, it's all you, whether it's your credit cards that you use for business or the home equity loan. The problem with converting the uh, credit card debt to home equity debt is the credit card debt is unsecured. So if you're not able to make those payments, nobody can come and get your stuff. You know, you, your credit record is already suffering and it's going to be damaged even more if you don't make those payments. The home equity loan if you use that to pay off the credit card debt, 
then um, you're putting your home at risk. It is secured debt. So if you don't make those payments, then somebody could actually foreclose on your home. Also, there's this real question about whether you can use the, the tax deduction on a home equity loan if you're using it for something other than improving your house. So be careful about that. It is possible to do that. I will tell you, home equity loans that we're seeing right now are usually 8% or higher, and uh, credit card debt is probably going to be around the 20 to 22% range. Um, so first start by looking at your credit card debt. List it all. What is the interest rate on each of those cards? What is the amount can you deal with that gradually, or is it better to push it onto the home equity uh, line of credit or home equity loan to clear them out and lower that overall interest rate? But just be careful, because once you do that, you're going to have to make sure you keep up with those payments or you're putting your house at risk. Okay. Thank you. All right, Alicia. Thanks for your call. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Time to take another break. Uh, When we get back, we'll continue looking for your personal finance questions. And also, we've got some money-saving hacks that we can go through. We'll be back with more after this. We're glad you found our show, Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lottridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives. We've got a caller on the line that I'm going to get to in just a minute. But, Nancy, I had a couple of thoughts on the previous call that we had before the break, and it was someone who was wondering whether they should uh, apply for a home equity loan uh, to pay off credit card debt. And you brought up the good point that we've talked about on the air before, the secured versus unsecured debt. I had a couple of thoughts. One would be, you know, you could do a balance transfer to try to get a cheaper, uh, a lower interest rate. Uh, the caution that we usually give when we talk about those are, though, that you've got to pay close attention to the terms to make sure that you, you know, pay everything on time or you might going to get stuck with the interest that you were saving with whatever balance transfer offer you had to begin with. Right. And any balance transfer is going to have a fee attached, usually around 3% just to move those over. And the one question I have for Alicia is, in any of these approaches, whether it's using new cards with a 0% interest rate for a period of time or using your home equity, that all depends on your credit score. So if she's done some damage to her credit score with this credit card debt, she may have trouble qualifying for any of these options. And the other thing I would say about the, the credit scores, as we talked about, you know, debt is a part of it, but there are ways that you can kind of work on things as you're paying off your debt to make sure that your credit score gradually improves. And the, the, my favorite one, too, is pay on time. That's a big one. So if you have debt uh, that she's paying off over time but making at least the minimum payment every month, that's eventually going to Im- improve the credit score a little bit. Well, and that's where just sitting down and listing those cards, uh, because it's I'm guessing it's multiple cards, that's very common, again, with somebody starting a business. They're just, you know, trying to get their business up and running and using whatever card they can to get through and help with their cash flow. But list those cards, the rates being, the interest rates being charged on each of those, the balances that are due, and start to attack those first as you try to figure out can I qualify for some other option? And should I use my home in order to pay this off? And also speaking from personal experience, sometimes when you have credit card debt, you kind of try to not think about it because it's not a pleasant thought. But uh, you've recommended, and one thing that you helped me with, Nancy, is if you put it down there on paper and you see the numbers and it's like, oh my gosh, that's really more than I was pretending it was or thinking it was or whatever, that can sometimes give you that little jolt that you need to, to move in the right direction to remedy the situation. Well, and another thing, uh, and I run into this all the time, Kevin, with people starting a business, I think you need to be very reasonable. Remember, um, very few small businesses actually succeed. It's difficult to get a business up and running. Um, And the worst thing you can do is to keep throwing good money after bad. You need to be very objective with any business startup and say, okay, at this point, I just need to cut my losses and go. Um, because I have seen people drain their retirement accounts to support a losing business. And right now, we are in the midst of a really good economy. And my concern is if that turns south and your business is struggling now, you're really going to be in trouble. So any small business owner needs to not let their ego 
and their affection for this thing that they birthed, because I understand that, um, get in the way of making a sound financial decision. Sometimes you just, the best thing to do is shut it down. And also I would say if you have a, a third party that's not actively involved and who's someone, you know, whose financial advice you trust, it's good to have maybe someone as an advisor to kind of help you, you know, a reality check every now and then. You definitely need that. Um, you know, it, we have this notion, we start with an idea and we think this is a great idea. This is going to work in this area. And it's very hard to let go of that. Now, yes, I know that any new business is usually going to be cash flow negative for a while. Um, but you need to plan for that on the front end. And the way you plan for that is to not use those credit cards. You need to get your financing in order first, visit your banker, talk to family members, um, set aside your own cash that you're willing to put in the pot to make this work, but limit that. And then once you get through all of that, if it's still not working, be sensible. Let's go to Moss Point for our next caller. Lori's on the line. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, so I I realize uh, this isn't quite um, on the level of what you were just talking about, but it's a money hack to save money. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that probably already do this, but I realized that I was spending an enormous amount of money on paper towels. And um, so I... I looked at my budget, my weekly budget, and I, I said, this is ridiculous. So I went to Walmart and bought those cotton towels. You can get, I don't know, quite a few for like $5. And I just use the paper towels now for, like, say, something, um, I have to clean something up I don't want to put in my washing machine or food prep. Um, otherwise, I use the, the cotton towels, and it saved me a ton of money on paper towels. And it's environmentally better for you to do that, uh, probably, yeah. even with the washing. Yes. Lauren, yeah. that's a good one. Oh. I've, I've got a couple of uh, hand towels in my kitchen that I do the same things with. And you're right, so paper towels are, are good for some sort of spills or whatever. But a lot of times that, that good towel actually will do a better job than the paper towel would in the first place. Yeah, and then I just wash them over, and I have saved so much money. And then um, the other thing I wanted to tell you, you were talking about um, – freezing food. My favorite is lasagna. That is a great one. We call it the kitchen sink pot, a uh, pan, uh, whatever's left over. We put it in one and we freeze it. And then we pull it out a couple weeks later on a weeknight when we don't feel like cooking. So uh, Lori, could you call us when you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I love lasagna. <laughs> oh. Yes. All right, Lori, uh, thanks for the call. Good good suggestions there. Um, and that's, you know, we hadn't talked about this, but when we were talking about it earlier, that's kind of fun is if you stick something in the freezer and maybe forget about it, and then a couple weeks later you're like, oh, my gosh, look, there's some lasagna in there. It might be a little. And no work to do. It's just there ready for you, waiting. As we're going through a number of uh, money-saving hacks that r r relates to food prep, the next one on the list is something that I do kind of. Uh, the, the suggestion is to place lettuce in a Ziploc bag with a damp paper towel to maintain the freshness of your lettuce. Now, I have one of the green, um, I guess, Tupperware things that's supposed to help with the gas, and it help, helps keep the, um, the lettuce fresh. But I also do put a little paper towel in the bottom because it, it tends to soak up a lot of the moisture, and nobody, I, well, I don't think anybody likes wilted lettuce that much. No, but I don't think it's supposed to be a damp paper towel. I think it's supposed to be a dry one because the idea with any kind of leafy vegetable is to keep it dry. Otherwise, it will um, deteriorate. Um, yeah, and I use one of those um, lettuce crispers that is a spinner that gets rid of a lot of the moisture. And, um, and there are other things that you can do to keep food fresher longer and uh, one of my favorite places is to look at Instagram. I have learned all kinds of things about how to store my food. But you're right, and I, I sh should have seen that when I was typing that in. It, the damp paper towel, you don't want it to be damp. You do want it to be dry because it's going to soak up the extra moisture there. So good catch on that one. Uh, the next one says, pack your lunch a few days a week instead of dining out. This can lead to significant savings as eating out tops the list of household expenses. That's interesting. I, I wouldn't thought about that, but when you do think about it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, so 
I, I try to do this, uh, eat lunch at home every couple of days, although uh, sometimes I, I find myself being lazy and, and going out and getting something. And th- this reminds me of a point that Ryder makes a lot. If you enjoy eating out, don't, you know, yeah. don't, you know, not ever go, but just keep in mind some things and don't let it kind of get out of hand, I guess. Well, I mean, I enjoy going out to dinner and especially it's w- if it's with other friends, that's, that's the best use of my money at that point. But yes, don't get carried away and um, don't spend for something that doesn't really give you good value. Uh, I believe uh, Abram, our producer, wanted to chime in. Yeah, as far as eating out goes, I m- one thing that comes to my mind is like, especially if you're eating healthy or quote unquote healthy with fast food and stuff, like if you get a f- salad from a fast food restaurant, it's probably going to be cheaper than going and buying a full bag of salad or a full bag of lettuce or a full head of lettuce or whatever and then taking it home and then you use like a quarter of it for before it's gone. Well, that that could be true if it's you know just you uh, versus sharing with other people. So be careful about that. Also, I would say uh, the the places make a much fancier salad than I can make. And in my case, I think it's because I'm one person and I – like things, but I always like with cucumbers and things. Wonder, you know, even if I get just one cucumber, will I be able to eat it up in time before it it oh, goes bad? Me too. Especially since I'm the only one in my house who eats those things, like cucumbers <laughs> and bell peppers and radishes. But I will say there is, uh, I guess, there's a couple of restaurants out there that it's it's like a giant salad bar, and that did inspire me uh, to start eating salad at lunch. It's uh, it's cheap, but also, you know, again, as we talk about trying to eat maybe more healthy. Uh, if you have a salad for lunch instead of, say, my other choice would probably be a cheeseburger, <laughs> the salad is definitely uh, the except, preferred option there. Except my husband uh, has to put about half of the bottle of dressing on his salad. <laughs> I'm not sure it then qualifies. <laughs> That's true. Then well, I, I think it still beats out the cheeseburger, but your point is well made. <laughs> I don't know. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> At that point, you're getting nutrients and the fat from it, so it's great. <laughs> We're glad that you found our show, Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives. So we've been going through some money-saving tips, and the next one on the list, Nancy, is an interesting one. And again, I think probably might work better for larger families, but it's designate a day each week as a leftover day. And on that day, empty your refrigerator and serve all the remaining food in sort of a buffet style. That sounds like a kind of a fun family thing to do. Well, I think it works better with uh, my household with just the two of us, we just open the fridge and stand there and, and we divvy it out. Okay, I'll take this and <laughs> you take that. You know, I can't imagine if you had a bigger family, they'd be turning up their noses and, you know, they're not going to eat what's left over and there's not enough to cover everybody. Um, so it sounds like a good idea, but, you know, might be better for a smaller crew. Well, too, though, if it were a family and maybe you're having trouble getting everybody to at the dinner table at the same time, it could be like first come, first serve. So if, if you want the good stuff yeah, for the leftovers. Yeah. <laughs> like, like yesterday, I got the spaghetti and meatballs, <laughs> and my husband was out in the cold. That would, that would be one of my first go-tos as well. No, nothing beats a good plate of spaghetti, that's for sure. <laughs> Looks like we can wrap up the hour with some phone calls. We'll start with uh, our friend Kathleen calling in from Osaka. Good morning, Kathleen. You're on the air. Go ahead. Well, good morning, guys. Y'all are talking right up my alley. One a couple of quick tips I'm going to give you for saving money on food. One, buy what's in season. Mm-hmm. So if you go and you buy a case or a bushel of stuff, you can cook it, let it dry thoroughly, cool thoroughly, package it and keep it up. And most of the time, it, uh, food in the freezer lasts six months. So what I do is I stir fry and cook on top of the stove in the summer. And I cook in the oven during the winter. When you bake a chicken, bake two. You don't have to eat two. Break the other one down, put it up in the freezer when it's ready, and you have something to eat through the summer. I used to bake a turkey during the winter, even if I didn't need one. Keeps the house, gives me food, gives me something to do, and I have food down the way. But think ahead. Don't be afraid to cook large because you can always portion it. Because there's going to be days where you don't feel good or the lights go out or something like that, and you have food on hand. Have a good day, y'all. Stay prepared. 
All right, Kathleen, um, thanks for the call. You Kathleen's know, on top of it, isn't she? Yeah, and the one thing that she mentioned, I think that you can do even as a single person, it's probably a little bit more uh, advantageous, is the portioning. Is that I do this, especially on the front end, when you get, say, uh, 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 some tr- pork chops or whatever. You know, if you've got one that comes with maybe five or six, I immediately uh, take those out and put them in individual Ziploc bags and put them in the freezer that way so that you're not having to worry about a thawing large portions of something, you can just thaw the ones that you need uh, as you go along. So portioning uh, is a good one to uh, save some money. Let's back to the phone lines. We go off to Byram this time. We'll say good morning to Amy. Hey, good morning. Um, I I had a tip that came out of, um, I went to Whole Foods this, this spring and I bought a little um, basil plant in the um, produce section that's designed for you to just eat then. And I noticed it was like packed full of little tiny basil seedlings and I broke it up into four different pots and I'll tell you I've had so much basil and it was like two feet and um, you know even if you even if you go to the the garden center and you pay full price which is like five or six dollars for an herb pot you know you'll pay five or six dollars in the produce section uh, most places for um, you know just like a couple meals worth and so herbs are always you know, cost effective to grow versus buy. And I'm starting to um, learn to do some propagation. So uh, taking those suckers off my tomato plant and pop them in some water and I'm going to have new tomato plants. And you can do the same thing as you said with basil. You can and snip off the top and put it in water. In some cases, you can put some of those little branches that you pop off of your plants um, directly into soil and uh, use the seeds that you get from them to create new plants. So I'm learning to do some of that myself, and it's great fun. Good call, Amy. Thanks for the tip. And I would also say then you're always, as we talked earlier, you're getting fresh uh, herbs to put on your food, make the extra tasty. Uh, and also that's something that you might be able to pass along to friends. If you've you know got some basil and you got an extra uh, stalk or whatever it comes in there, you could share that with friends and, and spread the wealth, as it were. One final call, and it's going to go to Diane, who's called in this morning. Go ahead, Diane. You're on the air with us. Good morning. I was just um, I, I just wanted to call about the lady that was requesting information about transferring her uh, credit card debt into a home equity loan. Right. Go ahead. Which obviously going from eight percent from twenty four percent to eight percent makes a lot of sense. But one caution is is that if she decides to do that, she has to then start curbing her credit card expenses because she could she could really get into trouble if she continues to use the credit card, even though she's paid it off. Then she may end up with credit card debt and the home equity loan. It was just just a word of caution that people. Uh, Diane, I think that's a good. That's a great bit of wisdom because I have seen people do that, where you clear out that credit card debt and you fool yourself into thinking, hey, it's all gone. And you just, you know, it's a slippery slope and gradually you start to build back up and you still also have the home equity loan. Absolutely. Great call, Diane, and a great tip because that would be the same thing with a balance transfer. I think there would be the danger there is that you transfer, you know, from one card to another. Then all of a sudden, hey, look, I've got this card that has no balance on it and, and there's the, you know, you don't want to start putting money back on that. If you make one of these changes to kind of help you pay off the debt, you need to try to be, um, uh, determined enough to to stick the stick with it until until the debt gets paid off. So, Diane, that was an absolutely great tip. Thanks for calling in this morning. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. We're going over some uh, money saving tips. We've concentrated mostly on the grocery store, and there's one final one uh, at the grocery store that again I've tried to take advantage of, Nancy, and it's unit price is a way to compare uh, items that you're shopping for to get the best bargain. I will look at that because um, often it does make sense for you to maybe buy in a bigger amount as long as you have the storage to do that um, and then lower those unit costs on those items. And that's the thing is, you know, the uh, the unit price is the way that's going to be able to compare uh, two different size things. And I've said this before. My only problem with that is sometimes if the item is on the bottom shelf 
and there's a very <laughs> small price tag, I have a hard time seeing actually what the unit price is. You got to you got to start doing your squat. <laughs> well, see, that's the other thing. I did that, but then it's like someone behind me is like, you know, who is that old guy bent down there on the floor? <laughs> and I've also learned that sometimes at my age, when you get down maybe on hands and knees, it's a little bit more difficult <laughs> to get back up you when you're done. Find Find an eight-year-old wandering the aisles that can read that for you. So um, these just some tip tips, you know, some suggestions. If it works for you, great. If not, maybe there's a way that you can kind of uh, morph what we talked about into your family. But uh, just, you know, maybe, uh, Nancy, the bottom line for today is just keep an eye on things and realize that there are ways to save money at the grocery store. And so when you go shopping, maybe go in there with a little bit of plan ahead of time. Well, and not only look for ways to save on these various items, and uh, but to take that savings and do something with it, whether it's for enjoyment elsewhere or add to your retirement account or put in your savings account. That's the whole idea is to make your life overall better. That'll wrap us up for today. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by generous financial support from listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can find it at moneytalks.mpbonline.org. Or listen to the podcast, just search for Money Talks. So for Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to join us every Tuesday at 9 for Money Talks, heard only on MPB Think Radio. Money Talks.